I was very distraught because I dealt with home instability along with uh, losing my job and not being able to get it back. It was kind of a last hope for me. I had decided to look online, youth shelters, and one of the places that popped up was Hope House. And when I had walked in there, I was like, wow, this is actually like a home, and I like this feeling. I was very, very nervous, but I was also very happy knowing that even if it's only temporary, that it's still somewhere I can live and get my feet back up on. The need is real in this community. There are three to five teens per night, per high school, experiencing homelessness. At Hope House, we make it a priority to meet each teen with love, to serve them with dignity, and to offer them hope. When they first come to us, we're gonna make sure they have a a, a warm meal and, and a bed. And that's just the beginning of everything. While they're with us, we hope to get them on a better track than they are, than they were before they came to the house. Um, that's with school. Uh, a lot of our youth have dropped out of school, so we, we try to get them caught back up in school to see where they are, how far they're behind in credits. We work with them on securing a, an official ID for the state. Um, or social security card because those things are needed to, to get employment. And then we really work with them on their mental health uh, to make sure um, they're connected with a therapist while they're with us and hopefully that therapist can maintain a relationship with them even when they leave us. The staff had greeted me when I got there and were very kind and happy about it. I've connected with the staff greatly. I can talk about pretty much anything with them and it makes me really happy. I've made a couple goals, which include getting a job while at Hope House, which I've succeeded with so far, getting my license while there. The Hope House has helped me uh, figure out where to find affordable housing around and near where I live. I will be graduating by about the end of December, so earlier than my other classmates, which I'm very, very excited about. I'm hoping I can go to college and finish my pediatric nursing degree. The heart of Hope House is love. Love is the greatest gift of all, right? And we're trying to show these youth that someone in the world loves them, regardless of what they have been through. I think it's a really good place for people. I truly believe it. Love, dignity, and hope. God gives it, we all need it, and our Hope House offers it to kids in crisis, many of them homeless, ages 14 through 18. So I wanna say thanks for joining us online at West Tonka at Bush Lake, and if you're a guest today, glad to have you with us. And may this hope be your hope as we gather together. And so we find ourselves in a place where we're continuing our series in Nehemiah, and I've gotten um, to this point where I have a message today that I've prepared for for quite a while called Priorities, and that is to determine the order of things, to put first things first, to make what's most important important in your life. And really, it's not rocket science for us who have faith because God tells us what ought be priority in our lives. In fact, Jesus reinforced what God said from the very beginning when he was asked, what is the greatest command, the greatest priority of life? And it is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love people. That's the priority. So last week I gave an invitation for you to become an FP. An FP simply means a first paragrapher. Would you say yes and put your name and your story in the first paragraph of the next chapter of Westwood's journey called Love Builds? 
It's a two-year initiative of loving God and loving each other in a way that would accelerate um, here near Far Vision toward our 2028 goal and really catapult us to that given place. So what I'd like to do today is two things. <clears throat> I want to elevate what Nehemiah prioritized in Nehemiah chapter 9. But then I also want to elevate the here of here near far ministry so you have a taste of what Love Builds is and what we're inviting you to give to. Just give you an update. 2018, we cast the vision, and the here ministry was intended to say, by God's power, would you allow us to plant churches with the love of Christ or start a microsite or start multi-sites in our own backyards? And in these five years, God has done amazing things. So already there are two multi-sites, Bush Lake, shout out to you, West Tonka, amazing. We started that at Easter last year in the, in the pandemic. So that was courageous. Love what you're doing there. We have two microsites, one in prison and then in nursing homes. In homes, And then also we took the online campus, which is astonishing, and we turned it into a campus as part of our journey. And by the way, up until just a few weeks ago, our largest gathering has been online until three weeks ago when we had more people present at our campuses than online. So there's a shift that's taking place, and we're grateful for that. But also... Part of Love Builds includes the here ministry that calls us to open our hands with unprecedented amounts of mercy to help those in need. Because this is love. This is what it means to get the love thing right. And that's where the Hope House comes in. And that's an investment that we seek to make if the generosity of God's people through Westwood comes forth with Love Builds. The concept of Hope House actually came forth because of a research initiative that we did with our leadership board at Westwood well over a decade ago. And the question we were wrestling is, does it matter to be a church in a community? And if it does, what are the unmet needs in the community that the Church of Jesus Christ could meet? Social organizations aren't meeting, they don't exist, whatever that might be. A group of lay people spent 18 months and they researched spending time with representatives from every sector, from health, education, um, business, uh, and we just learned what's happening. What are the unmet needs in our community? They proposed to us, the board, four unmet needs that are significant. We've touched all four through the years, but the one that was elevated as most significant was a shelter for kids in crisis because there was no shelter in the southwest suburbs of the Twin Cities. How could that be? So a kid in crisis has to go into Hennepin County. How many kids in crisis are willing to go into Hennepin County? Not that many. And then there's the question, can we even verify the need, which is astonishing to me in light of what we've learned today, because I don't know if you realize this, in suburban communities especially, we hide our pockets of poverty with evergreen trees. But in the urban core, it's raw and in the open and real. So we said, let's give it a shot. So we took the home that we have in our Chanhassen campus and we converted it into a shelter, a refuge for kids in crisis. And we started it in 2015, we opened the doors. Since that time, we have served over 3,100 students, 14 through 18 years of age. We have turned away over 1,100 students. And so we have, last year, 300 kids that we had to turn away. So part of our investment is to expand the Hope House to have more beds, to help more kids in crisis. We want to help. And why are we in this place? Because you know this. There is a mental health crisis sweeping across the world and our nation, in our own backyards, in our own families. I don't know if you realize that 13% um, rise in diagnosis on mental health since the pandemic. 13% increase in substance abuse. And take hold of this, 30% increase in suicides since um, 20, in the last 20 years. Astonishing results. We ought not be losing lives because of mental health. Mental health. So we're taking a statement as a church, and this fall we're gonna do a series on mental health and what the scriptures say and how we can be a blessing to our community at large and our community here. But I, I brought an image from a conference, a small little group of gathering of leaders who came together, and Ed Stetzer put this image on the screen, and it's the, the photo of a Roman pipe which would bring water into villages and into homes. And you know the Roman Empire was the most successful, longest lasting empire in human history, almost a thousand years. And part of it had to do with the incredible gift of innovation that the Romans had. And we're living in a day when we have 
um, the best and greatest innovation chapter of, of our history. It's exciting what's taking place. If you have your cell phone with you, could you just hold it up for a second, just for a moment, just grab your cell phone. I'm not asking you to open it, study it, read it, just hold it up. That's all I'm asking, we just hold it up, all right? So this Roman pipe, if I go back to it, and you can put your phones down for a second. What we learned in this Roman pipe that brought water into villages is that what was feeding them was killing them because those pipes were made of lead. Now put your phones back up again. (laughs) What is feeding us is killing us. So much good, but so much harm. So we're seeking to be a church that responds to that, and we look forward to it. And we're gonna bring that help to kids in crisis and the Hope House, to our own church family um, here, as well as our neighborhood at large. So I'm just saying, as we continue Love Builds, would you commit to making a commitment? We're gonna come together on March 26th with our commitment cards and say, God, take and use us, your church, to your given ends. You got time to pray, to process, to consider how it is that God might use you. Let's turn the page to Nehemiah chapter nine. Nehemiah 9 is astonishingly on a parallel track with us here because it was, you could say, um, an invitation to become an FP, a first paragraph in the next chapter of Israel's history called Love Builds. Because now the walls are built up, the city is in ruins, and they're rebuilding the wall. And love will be a force to see that that gets done as well. And we find that there's a beautiful picture that happens in the midst of it because they are a people who had been dealing with a dead faith. That they were, not just for a day or a month or a year, for decades, they had become a wayward people. So they were dead faith people versus a live faith people. And you know the difference between dead faith and a live faith is dead faith believes, it has belief, but not the Holy Spirit. And a live faith people beliefs, we have belief, and we are activated by the Holy Spirit. We're animated by the Holy Spirit to love God and to love each other, to be who God wants us to be and do what God wants us to do. And once that's active, wow, amazing things happen. And we find in Nehemiah that there is a priority of love for God and each other, and it shows up in this beautiful expression of worship and prayer, worship and prayer. When you love God, your heart compelled to worship, and your knees bow in prayer. That's my message today. Really, that prayer is our way forward, and worship is our starting place. I said this a couple of weeks ago, that God wants to do a great work, do you believe this, in you, for you, and through you. And it's worship and prayer that opens the door of God's love to be poured out in life and in journey. And that's exactly what we have here. We find in Nehemiah chapter nine, it's all a prayer. And can I just tell you, it's not a restaurant prayer, short prayer. It's a long prayer. It's the longest prayer in the Bible. There are 26 qualities of God that get praise for who he is and what he does. And I really wrestled over this. Do I wanna do a 26 point sermon? I'm just not sure you'd hang in there long enough for 26 points. So I had to do some synthesis and bring it forth and go, how do I want to share at least a representative core of who God is and what he does? And I decided to use a frame of reference that was introduced to me, a pattern of prayer that helped me in my early Christian journey. When I first put my faith in Christ, I struggled with praying, especially for anything longer than just a moment. I struggled with words that grows over time as you grow in love with God. But somebody introduced to me this pattern of prayer. You might be familiar with it called ACTS, Acts, Adoration, Confession confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. I would use that frame of reference for many, many years. It became a a grounding for me to learn how to pray. And the A stands for adoration. And adoration means to adore, that is to worship God, to honor him, to just bless his name, to love him. That's what it is to worship. In fact, um, we have a a niece who's just had a baby, and I'm in this baby mode right now. I'm not sure why that is. I'm empty nester for a long time, and I was fine. I had that empty nester. That's sweet paradise. (laughs) But then baby started to come along, just taking my heart. I look into a baby's eyes. Do you feel this way? You go, you are so adorable. I just adore you, and you feel the affection for life. 
and God is the life giver. And we're putting our affection on the life giver who is God. And that's exactly what we see here in verse um, three of chapter nine. They stood where they were and read from the book of the law of the Lord, their God, for a quarter of the day and spent another quarter in confession and in worshiping the Lord, um, their God. You see this picture, it's a six hour sermon. I just love this. I feel I have a biblical grounds to keep going. But I know you got plans for the day. But I think about this for those people because they just have not been into God. Can I just say that? Maybe you're in that place. You know, I'm just not much into God. I have friends who are into God and you know, I'm here today because I got a spouse who's into God. or whatever. They were not into God. They were dead faith people. But something would happen. And they came to a worship expression. They opened up the word of God and started teaching from it and had a six-hour sermon. And nobody left. And nobody slept. (laughs) I'm just saying I have a view. You're safe at home, but I have a view when we gather. Why? Because they were interested. Their dead faith was awakened. They were alive and God had taken hold of them. See, because worship is our starting place to the love of God. You could say it's our entry point. And you gotta pause on that because we don't think of worship as being entrance. We most think of worship as being an escape. To a retreat up north, getting away from hardship in life. To get 20 minutes of focused worship in song, but that's not the heart of worship. That worship, my friends, is not first about inspiration. It's about transformation. That is, God's first desire for your life is not to give you goosebumps and make you feel better about life. It is to change you. It is to transform you, to be in love like him. In the good, in the heart of your life, he is making us a new people. And that's the heart of worship. And I'm glad for that heart because he's really saying, come into my presence, enter It's an entry point. Enter into my presence and I will show you who I am and what I made you to be. And I think I want that kind of worship because in my depth and I believe in your depth of heart, you want to see God. You want to see his face. You want to know who he is. I want to know who God is and I want to know what he made me to be. What is his purpose for my life? Why did he breathe life into me? Joel Johnson, and he's done the same for you. This is what worship does. It opens us up to the very purpose of God. And so they come into this pattern of a new people. They're being changed and they're caught up into this six-hour expression of worship through teaching from the word of God, and they adore him. They adore him. I can't go through all of the points there, but I can give you a few of them. They adore him for his eternal nature, that God is eternal eternal, and we find this expression, stand up and praise the Lord your God who is from everlasting to everlasting. That before anything existed, God existed. That everything comes from him, everything belongs to him, everything is ruled by him, everything is returned to him because he is the G-O-E, he is the God of everything. He's the everything of my life, of my wife, of my finances, of my kids, of my relationships, of my recreation, everything. And they come into this place and because they had been away a long time, they they go, oh yeah, I remember. You are eternal. You are the God who always was, is, and will be. And then they continue on and they say, God is the only God. And we find those words really simply stated, you alone are the Lord. But remember, they had been a dead faith people. They weren't much into God. And so they let other things become their God. And they let other gods of other nations become their God. But now they come to say there is none like you. And they remember the words of God himself. You shall have no other gods before me. And they reclaim that truth and proclaim, God, you are the only God. I praise you and I bless you. And their worship continues. And they adore God because he is the creator God. And look at the scope of the detail they express in their prayer. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life, oh, you 
give life to everything. And the multitudes of heaven worship you. That our God made our planet. Our God made our cosmos. Our God made us in his likeness, in his image. Our God made the creatures of the earth, all your dogs and cats and cows and pigs. Does anybody have any pigs any longer? No, no pigs, and they're still important. And God said, oh, good, we've got one pig owner right over here. It's, it's great. It's, God created all this, the fish of the sea that he created, the multitudes in the heavenly realm, angels who worship him and serve him. You find this beautiful expression of the creator God who is the life giver God. And if he is the life giver God, indeed, if he is the one who has breathed life into you, that you didn't just come from nowhere, that God purposed you with your mom and dad to bring you into this world, then any meaning and any value and any purpose in life has to be tethered to the God who gave us that life, doesn't it? Isn't there an amen in the room? Isn't that true? It's, it's kind of common sense. So they'd gotten away from God, weren't into God, but now they're back. They're not dead faith people. They are alive faith people. They prioritize worship and praise him for who he is, but also they enter into a place of prayer because prayers are way forward. It always has been. And they confess. The expression of confession is amazing. They adore God for who he is. They confess him for the sin in their lives. And look at what it says in their confession. The Israelites gathered together, fasting and wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads. They stood in their places and confessed their sins and the sins of their, everybody? Ancestors. You know, I've referenced this a couple of times in Nehemiah just because our Western countries, um, Europe, United States, we're so individually inclined. We make our relationship with God about me, myself, and I, but that's not the filter of God. God is communal. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, work in communal to communion together, created us in the image of communion. We need each other, friends. We belong to each other. And when it comes to confession of our sin, our sin isn't just personal, it's generational that is, some of the sins, some of the things that we do are the things that our families have done for generations. And you know I'm speaking to some of you right now that there's a brokenness. You feel like there's a curse sometimes in your family system, that there's even maybe a trauma for some of you because of generational sins that haven't been dealt with. We're called to come and confess our sins before the Lord, and he washes us clean, there's no doubt, but we're also called to confess the communal nature we found this in Nehemiah chapter one, and I reference, I do briefly now, that in my family system, there was plenty of generational sin, alcoholism at the top of the game there. My great-grandfather died in a bar fight, inebriated. He was a beautiful man, and he needed to be here. My father fell into the same pattern, alcoholism, but can I tell you, my dad at 50 years of age, quit cold. And I go, how did that happen? I think through prayer, my prayer, other prayers, I say, oh Lord, would you break the generational burden and the havoc that it's created in my family system, which you could see carnage everywhere in my family. I go, and my prayer for my own life was, God, let me not be controlled by the power of alcohol, but by the power of the Holy Spirit as I had put my faith in Christ, because I was becoming a new person. I was moving from dead faith to a live faith. I like alive better than dead, amen? <laughs> Anybody? We like alive better than dead. And God postures us to experience that beautiful new position that we have in our Lord. And so we confess. And do you see here in the passage, too, the Israelites gathered together fasting and wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads. Sounds like Ash Wednesday, doesn't it? Dust and ashes, we do it in the form of the cross. So for people who say, oh, I don't participate in Lent and Ash Wednesday because that was generated by the church, I have biblical grounds to say no. It got expressed here. Because dust, we came from the dust, we returned to the dust. It speaks to our finiteness, our mortality, that we will die. The, the dust, the ash, and the symbol of the fact, it's a, it's a bold statement, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. That's why we wear it on the forehead. And so we enter into this season called Lent, and it's such an important season for us because we're preparing for Easter. That's what Lent is. We're right in the middle of it. And some of the practices of these 40 days before the Holy Week, and we celebrate the death and resurrection of Christ that gives us new life. There are practices that help us just elevate who Jesus is, taking us from dead faith to a live faith, even in greater measure. Those practices include confession of sin forgiving others for sins against you. 
If I could just pause for a moment on that because I know that's a big deal for some of you. There's somebody in your life right now who have so wronged you, you just are filled with anger and bitterness. You want nothing to do with them. Could it be in these 40 days God is prompting you to say, forgive that person? Or perhaps you've, you've sinned against another and you need to just put words to it and say, I'm so sorry for what I said or did. This is an elevated, it's like spring cleaning, you know, cleansing ourselves in anticipation of Holy Week. It includes um, giving to the poor. That's been one of the practices of Lent. It includes um, fasting. So are you fasting from anything in your life in order to elevate, to make your heart and eyes fixed on the Lord? I sure encourage you to do that. In fact, I have a statement. I'm going to fast from what? So that I may feast on the goodness of God. You may fast from a food or from sugars because then when you have that longing, you're, you're looking to God to bring help and strength. But maybe it's not food, maybe it's a mood you need to fast from. I'm gonna fast from anger so that I may feast on the goodness of God because if you're angry, you will not see the goodness of God, more or less feast on the goodness of God. It may be impatience, it may be defensiveness. What is it you wanna fast for as we approach Easter? Let the elevated nature of Christ be with you and for you. Remember Acts 3.19, repent, and turn to God so that your sins will be washed away. The order of that is really important. In the teaching of the church and history, we have mixed it up. I have confessed this before. As a teacher of the word of God, I just followed the patterns of teachers before, and I messed it up. Because what that is says, just listen again to it, is repent and turn to God so that your sins may be washed away and wiped away, and this is what it means. It's not turning away from sin that leads you and us to Christ, it's turning to Christ that leads us away from sin. So we try to deal with our sin in our own power, and we get so frustrated and so disappointed in ourselves. Why do I keep doing this? Because we make it about our power, but we are going to fail if that's the case. No, the promise is not turning away from sin that leads us to Christ. It's turning to Christ who gives us the power to wash away the sin. He washes away the sin so that we have new hope and we find new setting. I just think it's a powerful truth. And, you know, if you could say, got it, if you get it, I'd appreciate it. All right, it's such an important flow. Stop making it about you, make it about him, and watch God bless. We pick it up in Nehemiah 9.35, even while they were in their kingdom enjoying your great goodness to them in the spacious and fertile land you gave to them, they did not serve you or turn from their evil ways. He's just saying, God, we know we had it good in the fertile land. You kept pouring goodness and goodness and goodness on us, and we just ignored it and made it about us. I confess that to you. And for us who live in the land of plenty, it's easy to forget the God of abundance. He opened up the land of plenty. Friends, we live in the richest nation in the earth. We are the richest people. Even the lowest income person in our midst is richer than 90% of the world before us. We've experienced the goodness of God. We confess that we forget sometimes and we thank him for what he does in it. And that's really the next expression of the pattern of prayer. Moving to an adoration, who God is, confession, my sin, thanksgiving for what God does. And there's so much, I told you, it's not a short prayer, it's a long prayer. Can you, would you read it? You'll be touched. Read chapter nine and take in the posture of moving from dead faith to live faith because they proclaim that he is good, he is faithful, he's the covenant maker, he's the promise keeper, he is the miraculous way maker. The song that we sang in our worship in song earlier is inspired from Nehemiah chapter nine. He does this miracle life-giving adventure and included, and I'll bring one of these qualities to surface, that God leads and he guides. Take a look at the, the passage that speaks about leading and guiding. Because of your great compassion, you did not abandon them in the wilderness. They had been released from slavery under Egypt. By day, the pillar of the cloud did not fail to guide them on their path, nor the pillar of fire by night to shine on the way they were to take. Which way to go? He's leading them. You gave your good spirit to instruct them. What a picture here. Do you ever struggle? What, which direction am I going in my life? Where am I going? 
And all this passage is saying is they've moved into this alive faith place and they're renewed to trust God, as Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. You'll be confused. Acknowledge him in all his ways and he will make your path straight. Just tells you so clearly what to do, what not to do, what he will do, what not to do, or what to do is to trust in God. What not to do is lean on your own understanding. What he will do is guide and lead your steps. That's the promise that he makes there. And what a beautiful picture. And so you see that the, the cloud, our pillar of cloud guides them. So we have the Holy Spirit who is present with us as much as that pillar of cloud guiding us in the direction we should go. I have, a, I have a friend, not making it up at all, and his wife says to him, every time he leaves the house, follow the cloud. <laughs> Just love that. Carrie, you should say that to me. Joel, f- <laughs> follow the cloud. I know, it sounds so way out there, but it's just saying, know that the Lord is gonna lead you today and he's gonna guide your steps. Trust in him and follow him. Give thanks that he leads and guides. Let me come back to the pattern of prayer. Adoration for who God is, confession around my stuff, thanksgiving for what God does, supplication is simply intercession, which is simply prayer. Pray for others first and then pray for yourself. Start with others, because that's the nature of God. Then deal with your particular needs, and God is honored that. See, prayer is our way forward, and worship is our entry point. So when we were playing and laying this all out, we said, we we need to come together as the people of God to pray and worship, to pray and worship. So this Thursday evening, I want to invite you to come to a celebration of prayer and worship. I promise there is no six-hour sermon or 10-minute sermon, we're gonna come and pray and worship this Thursday at seven o'clock till 8, 15 p.m. I just wanna invite you, bring your kids. We're gonna pray together as families and worship the Lord together this Thursday evening. And we also will be praying for here, near, and far, and what God wants to do through Love Builds. We're gonna elevate here particularly, and I wanna do that even now, and invite, Dan, come on up. Dan Johnson is our middle school pastor, sixth through eighth grade. Do I need to say more? Pray for him. Pray for him and thank him. And he's doing a great job in leading us. Let's, let's have a seat. Let's not have a seat. Let's stand for this. Ah, oh, thank you. Give it up for Chris Wright, who just shows up. Love that. Oh, he's ready to sit. So this is really good. Just... Okay, Dan, you gotta move us into this story because you got a beautiful story. And Westwood enters into your journey in your teenage years. Share that. Yeah, I'm in seventh grade. I'm at Minnetonka Middle School West. It's a Wednesday. And I get off the bus. I enter into my home. And my mom is like, hey, Dan, uh, let's go to Lifetime today. You'll play some basketball for an hour. We'll get you a smoothie. You'll go to en route. En route is what middle school ministry was used to be called. Uh, She goes, you're going to enter out. I'll pick you up. Your friends will be there. It'll be great. She never told me it was a church. (laughs) And so go to Lifetime. I grab my smoothie. We go to the lower entrance. And this memory is just sealed in my mind. Um, I walk out of the car door. I take two steps. I turn around. Mom is gone. She has left (laughs) the parking lot. And I'm like, I have to go inside. And... As I walk into an route, I, I see five of my friends from MMW. They jump out of their chairs. They grab me a chair, and they're so happy that I'm there at Westwood with them. Yeah, so here we have a young guy, teenage years, unchurched, and his mom sets him up. <laughs> it's the gift of parenting. <laughs> I know what's best for you. You're going to say no if I say what I'm doing, so I'm just dropping you off. <laughs> what a gift. But that would lead toward this incredible opportunity, not just to grow in faith during that time, but to advance and become an intern in our internship here at Westwood. Share that part of your journey. Yeah, through the direction of my youth pastors at Westwood, I end up going to Bethel University, and as I'm entering into my junior year, uh, my old youth pastor reaches out to me over Instagram DM, and uh, she goes, hey, Dan, uh, I would love for you to join our internship program here at Westwood. You can apply. Here's the link. And I didn't really think much of it other than I was able to get an internship here at Westwood. I, I needed one to graduate. And within a week of being an intern here at Westwood, my former boss, he sits me down for coffee. And 
through this conversation, he just goes, Dan, you need to view yourself as a pastor in this ministry. You are a pastor in this ministry, and you will see yourself, conduct yourself, and you will pastor on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings. You'll introduce yourself as an intern, and you'll title your emails as an intern, but we're co-pastoring this ministry together. And uh, that was one of the first times that I realized, oh, I could be a pastor, and I have giftings, and yep. he pulled those out of me. Yep. I want to connect that. When we launched here near Far Vision in 2018, it included the launch of an internship that we wanted to be best practice, that some of those interns could potentially stay in our ministry, and others would be equipped to go into other churches and well-equipped. And you were part of the third cohort of that initiative. Our current Love Builds is to renew that and even expand it. And so part of our investment in Love Builds um, bears the fruit of the likes of Dan and his leadership with us because he did just didn't have the potential to become a pastor. He became a pastor in this beginning last summer of our student ministry, sixth through eighth grade. And you have a mission to kids. It's really powerful. Tell us about the ministry. Yeah, we have uh, two phrases that we're really passionate about in student ministries. It's you belong here, and it's help students love the church. And so we want every student when they walk into Westwood on Wednesday nights to feel like they belong here, that a leader cares for them, loves them, that me and Joe can come alongside of them and teach them the scriptures, and they're welcomed into a community. Also, we want them to help love the church, to get them in the presence of God on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings and yeah. change their life through that. And so... I think of the story of Titus, uh, who kind of creates this really well story of what it means to love the church and to feel like he belongs here. I took a group of 40 students to Big Sandy in January in McGregor, Minnesota on a zero degree weekend. Um, and Titus, he's this great boy, he's very brave. He's, um, we're walking in chapel together, it's the PM chapel. And he was like, hey Dan, I'm gonna, I'm gonna save you a spot in chapel, okay? You're gonna sit by me. It'll be great. We'll worship together. We'll listen to the sermon. It'll be so much fun. And I was like, great. I have a spot at chapel. Um, we get into chapel. We start worship. Titus is now standing on the chair next to me as we're singing. And mid-song, he just whispers in my ear and he just goes, Dan, I just, I love worship music because it gives me words to say to God when I don't always know what to say to God. Yeah. Um, and just to be at that moment for Titus to build his foundation for what it means to worship in song, for what it means to listen to a message, and to be at the building blocks of his faith as he creates it and makes it his own. Uh, it's one of the biggest blessings, I think, in middle school ministry. Love I love that you're teaching a high view of church. We get to be the church that was birthed by Jesus. He is the hope of the world, and you're building that foundation in their lives. Okay, we just got about a minute and a half here, so I got a couple things I want to throw your way. What is the most exciting thing happening this year in your life? I'm getting married. Yeah, there you go. And they, they, I'm just going to tell you, he's a blessed man because who are you marrying? My beautiful bride, Emma Freebesizer. There is Emma. <laughs> Some of you know Emma. She serves in our kids' ministry here. So I'm just saying, get your kids in ministry. You never know which direction it's going to go. <laughs> Let me connect that dot for you. They've inspired me because if you could share this just in you know 30 seconds or so, 40 seconds or so, I'd be grateful for that, but here's the, the call. They, they, they're going to participate in Love Builds. They're not even married yet. And I go, how did you make that decision? Yeah, we were a part of Love Build Services, and we've just been praying together about it, and kind of our heart posture with it is just that Westwood, for me, since seventh grade, has just always gone above and beyond. Uh, middle school ministry, high school, or even working as an intern, and, and now a pastor. Yep. Um, and that's just the heart posture we want to give back to Westwood, is just to go above and beyond with our finances and just our resources and just us in general back to Westwood and just. They're not even married yet. And they're joining together. And you know that finances will be part of your discussion all the <laughs> days of your life. Do you know that? Yeah. <laughs> just helping you out. Um, this is, you're just laying a great foundation for that given end. And so I just think it's good to celebrate the ministry. And God, we're, st we're so glad that you provided Dan Johnson to serve our kids. Um, you're making a difference. You're loved. We're grateful. And you will be a face and a voice in the Twin Cities for many years, and I pray decades to come. So thanks, Dan, for your leadership. Stand with me. Let's pray together. <laughs> Friends, we're going to come to this table and receive the bread and the cup in just a moment, but would you just receive this prayer with me? It's a directional prayer. Lord, we adore you and worship you. 
So everyone just choose a quality of God and adore him with it. We confess that we're sinners in need of a savior. Take a moment and confess a sin, personal or generational. And Lord, we're filled with gratitude to be your people. We thank you for who you are, what you've done today and always. We pray for your blessing upon Western, for your name to be exalted, for your favor to be given to Dan and Emma and their journey that's ahead, for his leadership and student ministry. Prosper it to your honor and glory, we pray and we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. We love you, Dan. Thank you. Thanks for sharing today. Yeah. Can we just take a few extended minutes to be together to come to the table because there's nothing more important. Let's take a word of thanksgiving from Nehemiah. Would you, with your voices, join me in a collective praise with these words. Join me. But you are forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. Therefore, you did not desert them that he does not desert you or destroy you. He delivers you and redeems you. He will not forsake you. He saves you. So when you have these moments feeling like, God, you must have had enough of me. You're sick of me, tired of me by now, no doubt. God is saying, oh no, not at all. I will never be sick of you or tired of you. I will not abandon you. In fact, it's like a father who loses his child in a crowd. He says, I'm gonna pursue you with all of my love because he is with us and for us. So when we come to this table, we take the bread and the cup and say, thank you, Lord, for coming and dying. Join me, Father God. We come to this table in our last minutes of being gathered together here, putting you at the center of our very being and expression of worship. So if there be anyone here who has had dead faith and they just know it, they have not been into you, move them by your spirit to this place to become alive. If there be anyone here who's been mediocre in their faith expression, renew them in this table experience. If there be anyone here who is just totally in love with you, may our hearts be renewed to the goodness you have given. And we exalt your name, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior of our souls, Savior of this world. We're filled with hope in your good name. Amen.